I, I love the Lord. And as Father John was leading us in prayer back there, he was putting the emphasis on that thought and that reality. You see, because the gospel is about love. It's about God loving us and you and I returning his love. Amen? So another way to say that is it's about a relationship. The gospel is a relationship with God. And he doesn't want anyone lonely. We use the word solipsism in philosophy. He doesn't want you to have a solipsism. It means cut off from everyone else, solo. He wants you to draw close to him. He said at one point, draw near to me, O man, and I will draw near to you. Amen? Amen. And so we want to walk in his love because love yields the fruit of peace and joy. Amen? Amen. If we're not happy, it's because we're not in love. Have you not ever seen a teenager in love? They're always smiling. You almost have to pull them down from the ceiling, <laughs> male or female. And all they do is talk about the beloved. Well, that's what it should be like with God. I want to tell you, God is infinitely and eternally beautiful. Amen? Amen. And just when you think you have him figured out, he throws you a curveball. <laughs> He's much greater than we realize. And by the way, when you do pray about these things, it's good to be specific and simple with God and say to God, for instance, Lord, reveal to me your love. That's a profound prayer. It's a prayer that any teenager could pray, but we should pray it too. Amen? Amen. Ponce de Leon was looking for the fountain of youth. I found it. <laughs> and we're both from Florida, he and I both. And I found it in the Eucharist, in the heart of Jesus Christ, and in the love of Mary. Amen? Amen? So we have something very, very valuable, you and I. Our faith, by the way, is not a static faith. It's dynamic. Our faith is a relationship with the living God. Amen? Amen. And what we have here, this friendship of love between Jesus and Mary and ourselves, it is everything. Amen? Amen? You don't need to look any further. All that you need is there in the heart of Jesus. So really, forget everything else. Keep that always front and center, your friendship and your relationship with God through Jesus and Mary. Amen? Amen. When the team that picked me up from the airport drove me here to the retreat house uh, two nights ago, Something you know, beautiful happened. This may be common to you, but for me, it's always special when this happens. Every time this has happened since I was ordained, it symbolized, it prophesied something special was about to happen. You know what that is? I see deer, live deer, sometimes in the most unexpected places too, and whenever that happens, it's always right before or right after a miracle. Amen? So when they, they, we pulled in right to the very front entrance, I've never seen this before at Malvern, at the, I mean right at the highway, as we pulled in, one deer and then two. And the Spirit immediately, immediately said to me, the Holy Spirit, Jesus and Mary. He said to me immediately, Jesus and Mary. That I think is the key to our retreat this weekend, really, those two names, Jesus and Mary. If we have those two names and we're in love with those two, we have everything. Beloved, listen, the Catholic faith is the pearl of great price. It is the pearl of great price. Amen? Amen. And you know, when I was a young man, I was once offered a job. I'm still pretty young, aren't I? <laughs> but I, I, I was offered a job as a teenager, and it just so happens that... Uh, there was a, a, a DJ in Tampa. Now, Tampa's a big media market. I think it's like number 13 in the country. So it's a rather big one, like Detroit would be, or San Francisco, one of those big ones, that whole Tampa metropolitan area. Well, the leading DJ in Florida happened to go to my church. And he was quite good, by the way, quite good. Johnny Stevens was his radio name, Johnny Stevens. He was fantastic. Anyway, he and I were lectors at the same church. 
I was a little teenage lector, and he was, he was, because he had that wonderful radio voice, you know what I mean? This is Johnny Stephen. All is going well today. And when he would lecture, you get that radio voice, you know what I mean? So he was good, but, uh, you know, um, maybe I was a little bit better. I'm not sure. <laughs> because he offered me a job. And so I was offered a job at the radio station, one of the top radio stations in the United States of America. And I was like, I'm very young. I mean, like 16. And it would have been a very good job. And he told me that he would train me and it would lead to some other things in the future, like being, like graduating to Los Angeles, San Francisco, maybe going to TV. And I thought about it and brought it to prayer. And I spoke to my dad and mom. A door was opening wide. And here is what I concluded. You can tell me whether I was right or wrong, but this is what I concluded. I had to tell my, my good friend, we were close friends. He went to Mass every Sunday. I was very proud of him. Even though he was kind of famous and popular, he went to Mass every Sunday, received Holy Communion, got married in the church. But I said, you know, I can't. Whatever gifts that I have, if I have any gifts at all, I have to serve Jesus. I have to use whatever I have for Jesus. I, I can't do it. If I do have something, then I want it for God. Amen? Amen? And so, you know, I thought about it later, because he, he left Tampa too to go to a bigger market, that I probably would be making $5 million a year minimum. <laughs> and you know what? I don't care because I hit the jackpot. I hit the jackpot. Amen? <laughs> I really did. You know, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything. You have the one who made all the gold. Don't go for the gold. Go for the one who made the gold, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So with all these things in mind, I believe that we Catholics should use the Word of God more, more profoundly, more effectively, and just more in general. So I'm fond of teaching this lesson all over the country. When you go home from the retreat, your first exercise, your first homework will be this. Try to locate that big, giant, fat book somewhere in your house. <laughs> find, see if you can find it. You may have to hire somebody to help you. And when you do, pull it down and take a deep, holy breath. And go like this. And blow all the dust off of your Bible and open it. That'll be your homework when you get home, okay? It's a Catholic book. The Protestants grabbed it and ran with it, and I say more power to them. Amen? We weren't using it, so they started using it. Amen? God always does that. We are the church of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? Who was there? Mary, the mother of the church, was there with the apostles. She was there at Pentecost. Pentecost is a totally Catholic affair. We were not using our gifts of tongues and prophecy and healing, so God raised up the Pentecostal churches. When we don't use the gift he gave us, did he not say it in the Bible? My gifts will not return to me in vain, he said. They will not return to me in vain. If my own church won't use my gifts, I'll give it to somebody else who will. Amen? Why am I getting Holy Spirit goosebumps right now? Because I'm speaking biblical truth. Amen? You may never have thought of that, but it's true. And think about the other side of it, though, is this. Once we start using our Bibles and using our Holy Spirit gifts, guess what's going to happen? All the evangelicals will come right back into the Catholic Church, and all the Pentecostals will come right back into the Catholic Church. We'll all be reading the Bible, praying in tongues, and worshiping God with Mary together. Amen? When we start using the gifts, they'll be drawn like a magnet. Amen? The division will only stay as long as we're not using the gifts. It's our Bible. They can use it, but we should start using it too. Amen? So let's now, in the Holy Spirit, use the Word of God as a tonic. The Word of God is a tonic. It's a healing remedy. The Word of God is a two-edged sword. It's a weapon as well. It's explained this way that it comforts the afflicted, 
but it afflicts the comfortable. That's why it's a two-edged sword. Amen? When you need comfort, it's there with healing. And when you and I need to be shaken up, it's there as well. So this is something beautiful. Psalm 92. And I would ask you to say it after me. Because the tonic works better when you drink it yourself. Amen? Amen. So I want to put the word of God on all of our lips. This is, this is worth a million dollars. Just reading the word. It is powerful, and I tell you what, even now, I say this rather realistically, I can't tell you what I'm seeing, but right now, demons are trembling right now. I see them in the air. They're trembling. They are afraid of God's holy word. Did you realize that? That's why he has Catholics lose their Bibles under a pile of dust on shelves, because if you pull it out and read it, you'll scare him to death. Amen? So let's, let's put a little of the fear of God in the enemy. Are you ready? Psalm 92, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you say this after me to God? It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To make music to your name, O Most High. To make music to your name, O Most High. To proclaim your love in the morning. And your truth in the watches of the night. On the tin string lyre and the lute. With the murmuring sound of the harp. Your deeds, O Lord, have made me glad. Now, I want to stop right there. Right there, I want to stop. Because this is when it goes into high gear, this psalm. It starts to get powerful. Your deeds, O Lord, have made me glad. I see in this a challenge to you and I, a challenge. You want God to be active in your life. And every problem and depression and despair in your life is simply a miracle waiting to happen. Amen? Amen? Every problem, every depression, every despair, every difficulty, every hard relationship is a miracle waiting to happen. God puts him there on purpose to see, will you lift your head up? Look up, Jerusalem. Your Savior comes from afar. Amen? Amen. We have to look up for the answer. Every problem, beloved, is an opportunity from God for a miracle. He wants to make something beautiful out of your life. As he said, you know, through Malcolm Muggeridge, the great British broadcaster, the great British journalist, who was more or less an atheist. He was a high Anglican, but he was, he was a, an atheist. And he, he encountered Mother Teresa. He heard about this woman, this holy woman helping the poor. He encountered, see, that's what happens when you meet God. You have an encounter. You don't just meet, you have an encounter with God through someone or something. He was so taken, he was brought back to faith and then entered the Roman Catholic Church. He became Roman Catholic. One of the most brilliant men in the world, Malcolm Muggeridge. And he wrote this book about her, about that you should get it. I think it's still available. You know what it's called? Something Beautiful for God. Isn't that a beautiful title? He was a journalist. Something Beautiful for God. That's Mother Teresa, you see, in her life. It so profoundly affected him. Well, the Lord wants me to tell you that through his mother and the flame, the flame of love, he wants to make your life something beautiful for God. Amen? Yeah. So we might continue more on this psalm, but I want to tell you about an event that occurred in my life as a young priest. Do you have time? Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, once I get going, even when I'm sick, I just can keep going. You know what I mean? Especially when I start feeling those flames from the Holy Spirit. So I don't know why, but the Spirit kept giving me this story from, I would say, my childhood, from my first year of priesthood. And I was in Texas at that time, and I was more or less being mentored by the founder of my community. I belong to what's called the SALT community which means the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. We got it all, don't we? Oh, boy. 
is we are a people in love with that holy woman. We are in love with Mary. We don't just love her, we're in love with her. Amen? Amen. And my founder, he also was Father Jim. We had a close bond, he and I. And it's because we had the same name. And you see, when he was a little boy, his Irish father would call him James, but in Ireland they, they call, they say Seamus. You probably heard that name, Seamus. That's Irish for James, Seamus. So his dad and mom would call him Seamus. So as a young priest, he would call me Seamus, you see? The name his dad and mom gave him. And I was hoping the other priest wouldn't get jealous, you see? Because I am little Seamus and he's big Seamus. And he would teach me things because we both had like, like a similar spirituality. We were like very charismatic, let's put it that way. I mean like all out for the Lord. Whatever he wants to do, you do. I don't try to control God, I want God to control me. Amen? Amen. I don't try to put God in my back pocket, I want to get in his back pocket. Amen? Amen. I don't want to be God to be my co-pilot, I want him to be the pilot. I'm the co-pilot, I want God to be the pilot. Amen? Hallelujah. And that's life lived well when God is number one. Amen? Amen? And that's when life starts becoming exciting. Amen? Amen? There's a story I want to share with you. I don't know why, but when God tells me to, I know there's always a reason. Now, this is extraordinary. I know it's extraordinary. But there actually were public witnesses to this, to what happened. And there are some important lessons here. And one reason why I want to share it with you is because I have a gift for you. My friend, Dr. Diane from Florida, brought me some St. Benedict medals for you tonight, and I have them on the altar. So I would like to bless them with the official exorcism blessing of the Catholic Church, those medals for you. Can I do that? So I want to explain to you the power of this medal, something extraordinary occurred in Texas, and then I want to bless these medals and give everyone here in the church a medal. If you already have one, God will show you what to do with it. Let him show you what to do with it. I would recommend, in particular, to give it to a teenager. So if you already have one, think of a young person who needs to be protected and give it to them. Still take it, but bring it to the one God tells you to. Amen? Amen. Well, what happened was that Father Jim, my founder, was also an exorcist. So he actually taught me some of those things too. It's really the best way to learn about certain ministries. It's best to learn through a mentor relationship rather than from a book. Now, I love the books and I read them all the time. I was studying Father Rippinger last night. It's good to stay studied up when you're a priest, a doctor, or a lawyer, to stay studied up. But the best way to learn is on the job. Amen? Amen. Well, Father Jim taught me many things and we got a call. When he was tired, he would give me his messages. So he really taught me well as a young priest. I had to take his workload. He was starting to get old, you know, and I was just coming up, you know. So he would give me his messages. And one came in about a house there near Corpus Christi, Texas, a haunted house. And the people in the house um, were seeing and hearing like strange things, in particular, growls. There was the growling of an animal in the house, a deep growl. And they called for help. So I asked Father Jim, would you like me to go to the house? He said yes. And so the gentleman of the house picked me up and he brought me there. And as we pulled in, now these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They should be operative inside of you and I. By the way, one of the best ways to keep the Holy Spirit alive inside of you, besides the flame of love prayer, is to pray the rosary and the most precious blood of Jesus Christ. Say that prayer. You know the front one revealed in Nigeria, in Africa? The 12 words, most precious blood of Jesus Christ. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy Virgin asked the visionary named Barnabas in Africa to have us say it 500 times a day if you can. So I do, but then the Lord told me two months ago he wanted me to start saying it a thousand times a day. So I do. 
I figured that way I can tell you to do 500 easy if I'm doing 1,000, you see? It was part of his reasoning, you see? So you have no excuses, because I'm doing it. And I did it today when I was sick, I did all 1,000. And you do it on the rosary beads, you go around your rosary. If you go around your rosary 10 times, you've done it 500 times, you see? I've never seen anything like it to unleash or unpack the Holy Spirit. Well, I mean, it makes perfect sense, does it not? One saint said that Jesus died on the cross and rose precisely to win for his church the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And so the precious blood of Jesus shed on the cross was the price paid for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. It's right there. And so when I invoke the blood, the Spirit comes. When I invoke the blood, that's the price. When I invoke it, it comes into the room and the Spirit comes down and floods the whole place. Amen? Amen. I use it all over the world and even with teenagers, and I've noticed this, that usually within saying it a handful of times, people all over the world, whatever language, tell me, Father, I feel the Holy Spirit. Everywhere. Even when I use it with atheists and pagans, they feel something. It's an amazing gift to the church in our time. So remember that. As I'm pulling into the driveway, I'm praying so the gifts are operative. As we pull into the driveway to the house, I've never been there before, I ask the driver, and I say, hey, Ray, listen, are there any Indians around here? And Ray says to me, oh, no, Father, no, there's no Indians here. Are you sure? Like, like, maybe this is a, like maybe this was an Indian village at one time where your suburb is? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So we pull into the house, and we get out. And I meet his wife, and we start going through the house with holy water to bless. And we get to like the third or fourth room. As, we, as Ray leads me into the room, I mean, this is kind of unusual. This is amazing. I'll explain it in a moment. We walked into the fourth room of the house. And what is it? It's basically a museum of American Indian paraphernalia. <laughs> uh, like a museum. There's a headdress and moccasins and tomahawks and everything else. It's all Indian gear. It's like a little, it's a nice little room. It's a little museum. And I said, Ray, I, I thought you said there were no Indians anywhere around here. And he said, oh, no, oh, 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 oh. And see, I've noticed this when you're fighting the evil spirit. He will blind or darken the intellect of the one he's in control of. It's things right in front of you that you've known all your life, you won't even know at that moment. Amen? Amen. There's my buddy, Monsignor Ralph. He reminds me like of a little tiny Indian. <laughs> and now he's sitting there like the chief, you know what I mean? <laughs> Would you give the chief a round of applause? Now we got a whole tribe up here. <laughs> well, we even have an Indian maiden too, it looks like. <laughs> so I, I've noticed this about the evil spirit, and I'm sure those who've worked like myself, if Monsignor Ralph has and Anthony has, that the devil will blind us to certain things right in front of us. Like, I'll ask somebody, do you like the color blue? I say, oh no, Father. And I look in their closet and there's 17 blue shirts. <laughs> it's like he, he blinds him from the obvious things. He blinds him in particular from things that if re revealed will spell his demise. Amen? He'll blind those things so you can't remember them. You've known them every day for 45 years, but that Tuesday you forget everything. Then when the priest leaves, they remember it again, you see? That's the work of the evil spirit. So we're in there, and this little museum is filled with Indian paraphernalia. And I'm looking at all of it. It's very interesting. And I said, Ray, I'd like to tell me there was nothing Indian here. He says, oh, oh no, Father, uh, uh, this house is built, um, this whole suburb was in a giant lawsuit that made the news all over the country uh, because they were building on an Indian burial ground.
it, sometimes it can be frustrating to be a priest, you know, because as we're pulling into the driveway, I'm asking Ray, based on the Holy Spirit, Ray, are there any Indians around here? And that's when I finally get it out of him. The devil actually blinded him. He didn't have a clue, although he knew it his whole life. It was, it was on national news. In the Corpus Christi area, they discovered they were building a suburb on Indian burial grounds. No wonder they were healing, hearing growling, if you get my drift. No wonder. Because the American Indians and other cultures too, not out of malice, but they would place a curse over the graveyards that if anyone would disturb the bones of their ancestors, they would be cursed to protect it, you see? All the Indians do that about one another's tribes. They all knew that. That's common in many cultures. So I said, Ray, stay next to me as I continue the blessing. Stay next to me. Now, Ray was twice as big as me. Ray was a huge fellow. So he was following me like a little boy, and I went to bless the room. I go to a few more minutes down the hallway, and I turn, and he's gone. <laughs> I'm telling you, such a lack of obedience, you know what I mean? <laughs> he's gone. So I don't know what to do, but I, I keep going. I don't know why he's not there. I actually said that for his protection. I wasn't being bossy. And he's twice as big as me, but I got something he ain't got. It's called holy orders. <laughs> the, the, the protection of the sacred priesthood, amen? I have that, and I know that. I want him next to me for his safety, because I knew we were stirring things up. And so I kept blessing, and a minute later, Ray comes running to me down the hall, crying, physically crying like a little boy. Crying. And he's shaking. He says, Father, 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 I was just out by the front door, and, and a lion growled at me. He heard a huge growl, not tiny, huge, the Lion King, he heard growl by the front door. And I looked at him, I knew what he's talking about. I didn't hear it. That attack was reserved for Ray, you see, for being disobedient. Honestly, you see, when we're disobedient, it's dangerous, isn't it? For all of us, it's dangerous when we're disobedient to the church, to the Holy Father, and by the way, even talking bad about the Holy Father is a form of disobedience. I know our Holy Father doesn't always say things in the perfect way, in the way that they always communicate with us well. He comes from a different culture. I'm used to that culture. I've worked down there in South America and Central America. It's a whole different way of thinking and talking. It's much more informal than we are here, you see? So don't let that fool you. Always respect your elders and your priests and especially the Pope. Don't be fooled by anything, don't be fooled. Don't even, don't even, if it bothers you, don't even read what he says, just pray for him, amen? But don't speak ugly about the Pope. That's a trap from Satan, it's a trap. I know the Pope makes boo-boos. In the meantime, just love him like as if he was your daddy, right? If your daddy was 75 and made a boo-boo, would you go around cursing your dad? I see faithful Catholics cursing the Holy Father or saying mean, harsh things as if they were the Pope and he was the little boy. I said, that's not right. So just keep that in mind, that obedience is essential even for our salvation. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, I told Ray, I said, Ray, you were disobedient. But I had to tell him because that's what happened. He left my protection and he broke what I asked him to not to do, and he encountered a, a huge roar. The man was shaking. He had turned white and was literally crying. It was that scary. I said, well, stay next to me now. And we finished the house, all the inside. We got all done. I said, Ray, now we're going to go outside. Now that you've revealed to me that this is an Indian burial ground, let's go outside now and bless the property. So I asked his holy wife to stay inside with her rosary. And she prayed the rosary. And I had another young priest with me, newly ordained. And I wanted him to be with me because he had a great interest in exorcism and in spiritual gifts, a very, a very holy young priest. And I was sort of giving a little bit of training. So he was with me. 
We went outside, the young priest, myself, and Mr. Ray. So I want to now tell you what I saw and what happened. I know it might sound incredible. I would say just put on your seatbelts and ask Our Lady for faith. Amen? These things happen, and the only reason we don't hear about them, is we don't see them as much, is because we don't pray for them. We don't exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't live a radical Christian life. Amen? We have to be radical. Not necessarily exteriorly, but definitely interiorly radical. All for you, God. All for you. Would you say that now? Say this. Say, all for you, God. All for you. Say this. Now say this. I'm all for you, God. Everything is for you. I love you, God. You're my number one. You're the best. You're everything. I need you. Lead me. Guide me. Give me miracles. Show me your holy face. Reveal to me your love and your power. Use me for wonderful things. Amen? Amen? Now look out. Your life is going to take a turn for the better this weekend. Look out. Amen? Amen? That's all he needs for you to open the door, right? That famous painting where the Lord's knocking on the door, you know that famous painting? And one of the art critics, the day it was, it was um, opened up and, and revealed at a museum, I think it was, he asked the artist, you made a boo-boo. He says, what's that? He says, well, there's no handle on the door. He thought he had him. And the artist told the, the art critic, that's because this door can only be opened from the inside. It represented the heart or the soul of man. There was no doorknob on purpose. We have to open the door from the inside. Amen? Amen. But tell Jesus, and if you're frightened, then tell Mama. That's why she's there. So if you're frightened, say, Mama, you take over. Amen? That's why he gave, us, gave her to us. He knew we might be frightened. Well, I'm out there in the front yard, just barely begun to bless. And I had medals with me. I always bring, always have these hand grenades in my suitcase wherever I travel. So I had a bag of 50 hand grenades in my suitcase. So I had them in my hand. We're gonna, we started planting them in the front of the house. Had not gone more than three minutes when my attention is gathered on high. It's dark, it's already like maybe nine o'clock at night, it's dark. I look up because something caught my attention on the roof. As I'm sprinkling the holy water, I just have to tell you what happened, okay? Let me just tell you what happened. I look up and there is an Indian on top of his porch with a tomahawk in his hand, crouched to jump on Ray. Crouched with a tomahawk. He's on top of the roof, the porch. I see him. God let me see him, you see? And I said, oh, do you see? Ray couldn't see, but Father John Mary said, Father, I have goosebumps all over my body. I said, well, I'm sure you do, because I can see him. And I said to the man, I said, you. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive us. He's looking at me. He's, his hand is raised with a tomahawk. He looks at me, and I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me, to forgive us for what we have done. And then I said to him, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died and shed his blood for you. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. When I said that, the man dropped the tomahawk and flew 100 miles an hour straight into the air, into the heavens, and was gone. And Father John Mary said, oh, Father, Father! <laughs> he couldn't see what I was seeing, and I didn't describe him what I just saw. He got the anointing a second time even stronger. I said, it's okay, so let's keep blessing. I go to bless, 
and there's some more Indians standing by the right front end of the house. Some more Indians, I see them standing there. And I stop. I said, brothers. And Father John Mary says, Father! <laughs> so the whole time, Father John Mary saw nothing but felt everything. I felt nothing but saw everything. We're a pretty good team there, you see? <laughs> Almost like a husband and wife, you know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, I see the three Indians there, and I stop, and I say, brothers, please forgive us for building on your sacred grounds. Please forgive us. And the, when I said that, they were immediately, it affected them. Like, they received that apology. That's what they were waiting for. Almost always when there's a haunted house, it's usually a trapped soul somewhere in that house who needs to be ministered to in some way. Sometimes it's a demon, but frequently it's a trapped soul. So, please forgive us. And then I said the same prayer to them because I realized these were American Indians in our country hundreds of years ago before any missionary ever even reached Texas. They never heard the name Jesus Christ. They were still there because they were waiting for the gospel. They were waiting for the gospel, and I knew it. And I said, Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sins, and he rose again. Accept him now. He loves you, and go to heaven. Whew, the three went straight up into heaven, like a streak of white light in front of me. Father John screaming, Father Jim! I said, yes, Father. Let's keep moving. So I planted some medals, and we get to the side. There's an absolutely true story, and by the way, that holy priest can testify to this. Ray has gone to his reward since then, but his wife can testify to what I'm telling you. I go to the side of the yard, and there I look up is a, an assembly of about, I'm just guessing, a host of women, Indian women, 25 to 50. And some of them are holding babies in their hands. And they're all there, very meek, very meek, like 25 to 50 women. It was, a, it was dark. It was a big crowd. I couldn't count them. And I looked at them. Father John's shouting again. And I say, my sisters, I said, Please forgive us for what we've done. Now, Jesus died for you. Receive him now and go to heaven. At that moment, all of them, let's say there were 25 of them, 25, at the same time, flew into heaven, straight up in front of me, leaving a streak of white light where they were. And the whole place was feeling, by the way, lighter and lighter. So we go around the corner, and this continues. We're planting meadows the whole time. We planted 50 hand grenades around the property. We finally got to the last one. We're in the last corner of the property. I have one meadow left. And this is true. One last meadow, number 50, in the last corner of the house. And so I go to plant it at the corner. I go to plant that metal at the corner of the house. Father John Mary makes a little hole for me. I bend down and I plant this metal. I drop it in the hole. When I drop that metal in the hole, I kid you not, this is what is publicly, a light, like a laser beam, a laser light came out of the corner of the house, <laughs> straight into heaven, and the whole house was released. The last, I don't know what that was, I think it was like the chief. I didn't see him, I just saw the light leave, a, a laser light, and I knew that the last curse had been broken. I knew it, you could just feel it. Boom, Ray, the big huge Ray next to me, literally jumped back and started crying like a little boy. It scared him to death. Now I thought it was pretty cool to be honest with you. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. Like, do it again! Do it again! You know what I mean? I don't know if we get scared. I thought it was pretty cool. You know what I mean? I like being a charismatic priest. I like it. I mean, it's kind of fun. You know what I mean? 
We're the real men in black. We're the real men in black. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ray, he was crying. I didn't know why he was crying. I thought it was the neatest thing in the whole world. And he's weeping. And I said, Ray, it's, it's all done. It's all done. Calm down. It's okay. So we got him. He got settled. We got him peaceful. And we went back inside the house. We went in the house. His wife had been praying the rosary the whole time. As we walked in, Mama said to me, Father, what just happened two minutes ago? She was inside, you see, all by herself with a rosary. I described her what had occurred. She said, Father, two minutes ago, the whole house lit up inside. And now, even now, there's been a fog. She started to cry. There's been a fog in our house for more than 10 years. Like, like a, not like a fog you see in the sky, but like a, a darkness in the house. Father, it's all gone. The whole house was light and clear. She felt it and she saw it. And from that night, everything was beautiful. In fact, filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. And those two became rather saintly, by the way, that husband and wife. So when God allows a battle, you can be sure he's calling you to holiness, right? When you have a battle, he's calling you to sanctity. You know, as they say, no one becomes saintly on cheesecake and ice cream. <laughs> you might gain a few pounds, but it won't make you saintly. It might be a little bit sweet, but it won't be the sweetness of sanctity. You become holy through prayer and suffering. Amen? You could add a little bit more to that, a little bit more through study and obedience as well, right? Study and obedience, prayer and suffering. Well, they became, I think, rather holy, and Ray has gone to his reward. And this scripture verse that we finished on for Psalm 92, it really captures that. Remember the last line we said, your deeds, O Lord, have made me glad. For the work of your hands, I shout with joy. O Lord, how great are your works. How deep are your designs. Are your designs. The foolish man cannot know this. And the fool cannot understand. Though the wicked spring up like grass, and all who do evil thrive, and all who do evil thrive. They, are they are doomed to be eternally destroyed. But you, Lord, but you, Lord are, eternally are eternally on high. See how your enemies perish. See how your enemies perish. All doers of evil are scattered. Now hold your right hand like this and make a fist and say this after me. To me, you give the wild ox's strength. To me, you give the wild ox's strength. Now say it again with more conviction. Ready? To me, you give the wild ox's strength. Say, I'm an ox. I'm a good looking ox. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Never use that as an insult, it's a compliment. Amen. You're a good-looking bunch of oxen. That's what you are. <laughs> Isn't God great? Doesn't the Bible say in Nehemiah, the joy, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. Amen? It's fun to be a Christian, isn't it? I think that somebody has hid the whole thing under, under a cover somewhere, making it all like miserable and prune-faced. No. Teresa of Avila said, God, God, spare the church of one more prune-faced saint. Spare the church. Amen? That's what Teresa of Avila said. Lord, spare the church of one more grouchy-faced saint. Amen? <laughs> Alleluia. Because joy, one saint said, joy is the surest sign of the presence of God is joy. Amen? And the Eucharist, beloved, is pan de gozo, is the bread of joy. So when you receive Holy Communion, remember last night we spoke about letting communion burn your tongue? 
You have to either pray for that grace from Our Lady. It will happen one way or the other. It will happen. But also pray for the joy of the Eucharist. It is, the Lord says, it is my joy, he says, to be among men. That's right from the Bible. It is my joy to be among the children of men. You know how you, you, know how you spell that? Eucharist. That's how you spell that. That's, the Eucharist is the Lord's joy. He can remain to be with us until the end of time. Until, he says, my Father's plans are all fulfilled. The Eucharist is my way of being with you. It is my joy. And so when you receive the Eucharist, you want to ask God to release joy inside of you. Lord, give me your joy. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. So let's um, pray a little bit more of this psalm. Would you say this after me? To me you give the wild ox's strength. You anoint me with the purest oil. What oil is that? The oil of gladness. It's the Holy Spirit. The purest oil is the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus, the Bible says, was anointed with the oil of gladness. The only oil that touched him was the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He is the purest oil. Amen? Amen? I'm going to put oil in your forehead tonight. As I do, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to go through the oil inside of you. Amen? Amen. He is the purest oil. Alleluia. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Spread the effect of grace, of thy flame of love, over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.